Hello friends, this is Pastor Patrick. Welcome you again to a virtual Sunday worship with the Smithfield Baptist Church family. We are glad that you're with us. We're honored that you are here. It is a joy and a blessing to be able to use technology to come together this morning to worship our Lord. Because even in difficult times, this is a day the Lord has made and we will rejoice in it. So we're glad you decided to join with us this morning as we prepare to sing praises to the Lord, pray to Him, and to dig into His words. We're glad you're here. I do want to give you a couple of announcements before we get started in our music prepare our hearts for worship. The first is that we want to make sure that our church family and our community know and continue to know that we are here and we are available and we are willing to help in any way that we can. While our office is not open, uh, regular hours, we are ready to help. We are checking emails, we are checking phone messages, we have our deacons, volunteers, our staff are ready to assist you in any way that we can during this difficult time. So please let us know. Check out our website and see our contact info. Message us on Facebook. There's lots of ways to reach us and we are here for our church family and our community in any way that we can. The second uh, announcement that I want to give to you today is also an important one. Our church publish, publishes a monthly newsletter. We call that the Grapevine, and we send it out through our office every month, and we're going to do that again this month as well. So if you are on our normal mailing list for our newsletter, you don't need to do anything. But if you would like to receive a newsletter and you do not normally receive one in the mail from us, we want to make sure that you get that. So please call into the church phone, leave a message leave your contact info, leave your address, and we will make sure that you get one. You can also email our office manager, Shannon, and she will make sure that she adds you to the mailing list. So if you would like to receive a monthly Grapevine newsletter article and you are not already receiving it, uh, then please just let us know through one of the many different ways that I gave you already. So with that being said, we hope and pray that you are being safe. We hope and pray that during this difficult time you feel God's presence in a powerful way. He offers and promises the peace that passes all understanding to his children and those who seek and call out to him. So it is our prayer that you are feeling his peace today and that you will use this time in worship to feel him in an even deeper way this morning. So now let's let our musicians prepare our hearts for worship.
Our biblical passage this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew. It is chapter 20. So I would encourage you to grab your Bibles and read along with me. That is Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. So please join with me as we read. Uh, This is Jesus who is speaking, giving us a parable to demonstrate the incredible awesomeness of grace that he offers. So join with me, chapter 20, verse 1 through 16. And Jesus says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius for the day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to those he said, You too, go into the vineyard, and whatever is right, I will give you. And so they went. Again, he went out about the sixth, and the ninth hour, and did the same thing. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, Why have you been standing here idle all day long? And they said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You too, go into the vineyard. And when evening had come, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last group to the first. And when those hired about the eleventh hour came, each one received a denarius. And when those hired first came, they thought that they would receive more. And they also received each one a denarius. And when they received it, they grumbled at the landowner, saying, These last men have worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden and the scorching heat of the day. But he answered and said to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go your way. But I wish to give to this last man the same as to you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with what is my own? Or is your eye envious because I am generous? Thus the last shall be first, and the first last. The word of the Lord. So let's begin here with some narrative background so that we can make sure that we're all on the same page. It's important, especially with parables, that we get some of the details worked out here so that we can all uh, learn as much as we can and be led by the Holy Spirit. So this is a typical parable of Jesus where he gives us a deep spiritual truth through a story. And this is a a vineyard owner who goes to the marketplace to hire laborers for the day. And the marketplace is the location where those who wanted to come and work for the day, they would show up there and then they would be hired and they would go out and do the day's work. Now, a day laborer, the typical wage was one denarius. That was a typical uh, pay for someone to come and work in this kind of skill level, in this kind of arena. Uh, They would go, they do the work, they get paid at night and they'd go home. Now, an interesting thing to remember here is that many, many in this time frame in the ancient world, uh, in Jesus' day here in the Holy Land, uh, would literally have made for the day what they needed to sustain themselves. So their food, their provision, their keeping their family well, all of those things were tied to them earning salary, wage uh, for that day. Uh, There would not have been much concept uh, for the vast majority of the population of a savings or money earned above just basic necessities. What you made that day was often what you would live on. So if you didn't work, then you didn't have the money to sustain yourself and your family. So the typical work day for uh, this kind of work would have been 6 o'clock in the morning to 6 p.m. That would have been 6 in the morning would have been the first hour. So of course then 9 o'clock in the morning is 3rd, uh, noon is the 6th hour, and those that were uh, hired at the uh, at 5 o'clock in the evening would have been the 11th hour. So of course we get these groups of laborers. Uh, the first ones are hired at 6 in the morning. As they tell us, they work all day in the scorching heat of the sun. They bear the burden. And the vineyard owner goes out several different times and hires more people. And then finally, he comes to 5 o'clock in the evening, and he sees individuals still standing there in the marketplace waiting to be hired. And he says, why are you here? And they tell him, no one's hired us. So he says, you too. Get on out. Get into my vineyard. And you work as well. Now, you can see the scene playing out 
Uh, and maybe something like this has happened in your childhood or your life where you were expecting more than you got. Uh, so they all line up for their pay for the day. Of course, the ones being hired last come first in line. And the owner has his foreman give them a denarius, which was the wage for the day. So, of course, the ones in the back who have been waiting and working and uh, have been doing all the heavy labor, especially through the, the noonday sun, are thinking, hey, this is great. If they got a denarius, then maybe we'll get tw two denarius to denarii. Uh, and so they're thinking this is going to be an awesome situation. This is perfect. So they get to the front. Of course, they get their one. And like, what is this? What, what have we worked all day? And of course, the owner says, are you upset because I'm being generous? It is mine to give. I have every right to give it. So don't give me an evil eye because you don't understand my generosity. And so there's a deep, deep spiritual meaning here. And it is the last shall be first and the first last. And it specifically speaks about God's grace. See, God's grace is the theological concept, uh, unmerited favor, as we all memorize in seminary, that we have not deserved, we have not merited the grace, the love, the salvation that Jesus Christ has offered us, that God, through his Son, has given to all who will become children of God. And so grace is the idea that we didn't earn it, we didn't buy it, we weren't good enough for it, we didn't deserve it in any way, shape, or form, and it is given to all who come to God freely and with no strings attached. And friends, it is an essential Christian doctrine is the very basis of our salvation, the very basis of our relationship with God and what it means to be a Christian and a follower of Christ, a child of God, to be covered by God's grace. And so I wanted to read uh, to you uh, just a little snippet here. Uh, I've got several readings that I want to give you today, so I apologize in advance for that, but I do have several things I wanted you to hear. And the vast majority of them come from Philip Yancey's book, What's So Amazing About Grace? What's So Amazing About Grace? It is a really good book. And so I really recommend it. Some of you may have a little free time. You may have some extra time on your hands because of the virus that's going on. So I would just encourage you, uh, get onto Amazon or other places and type this book in and get this and put down the TV remote for just a little while uh, if that's what you've been spending some of your time doing. And pick up this book, read this book, What's So Amazing About Grace by Philip Yancey. So several of my quotes today will come from that book. So the first one is a story that Philip Yancey uh, read tells for us, and it goes like this. I'm going to read it from uh, right off page 329 in my edition. Uh, and he records for us, during a British conference on comparative religions, experts from around the world debated what, if any, belief was unique to the Christian faith. They began eliminating possibilities. Incarnation? Well, other religions had different versions of God appearing in human form. Resurrection? Again, other religions had accounts of return from death. The debate went on for some time until C.S. Lewis wandered into the room, and you know he's one of my favorites, but C.S. Lewis wanders into the room and he says, what's all the rumpus about? Remember, he's British. He asked that and he heard in reply what his colleagues were discussing about Christianity's unique contribution among world religions, and Lewis responded, oh, that's easy, it's grace. After some discussion, those at the conference had to agree. The notion of God's love coming to us, free of charge, no strings attached, seems to go against every instinct of humanity. The Buddhist Eightfold Path, the Hindu Doctrine of Karma, the Jewish Covenant, and Muslim Code of Law, each of these offers a way to earn God's approval. Only Christianity dares to make God's love unconditional. And so friends, you may have been joining us regularly as we have virtually worshiped together, or you may have just stumbled across 
upon us through the internet or perhaps you're looking for a community to worship with right now and it is essential that you understand that grace is the very center of what God has done and what God offers us in relationship with him the belief that we not deserving having no value in ourselves to earn our salvation nothing to give nothing to offer have been granted by God's action in Jesus Christ acceptance love uh, becoming his child that is grace friends and Nancy records for us uh, that if you dig into the background of that word grace it goes back to meaning something along the lines of I rejoice I am glad that's kind of the background of that word grace and, and friends grace should make us glad it should give us reasons for rejoicing so our thought here is that grace is Christianity's offering to the world you will not find that idea that concept in the other religions of our world and that's in a, just a, such a valuable valuable piece of of knowledge that we as children of God through Jesus Christ have uh, that we can rely on that we can live within is that we've done nothing to deserve this but it has been given to us by God so now one of the issues we face in our humanity one of the lies that Satan tells us one of the things that we see permeated throughout our culture and our movies and our books our TV shows is the lie from hell that says if you are good enough you will make it to heaven if you are good enough if you live a good life if you treat people kindly if you take care of little animals if you do beautiful little things for people then you will be good you will be deemed good and you will make it into heaven and the Bible's doctrine and teaching of grace and Jesus death on a cross and resurrection in an empty tomb tell us that that is not the value that is not the measuring stick and the first problem, of course, is that when you start talking about good and bad, I mean, what kind of uh, scale are you using? It moves. It, it's 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 easy to decide. Okay, well, that person was good. That person was bad. But I mean, who's making that decision? And the Bible tells us that there is no decision beyond God's choice to extend grace and His children to grab onto it and to become His children. So, it is a lie. It is not true that if you live whatever the society dictates as a good person that you will make it into heaven. Let me be very clear, friends, especially if you are a visitor this morning, if you are a guest under this uh, virtual worship, there is no way you can be good enough to earn God's favor. It's already been bought for you. It's already been provided for you. It's already been given if you will accept it. It is the grace of Jesus Christ death resurrection is offered to all who will accept it so that's what grace is that is a joyous message this morning it's a message that we should all just we should be shouting it from the rooftops because it liberates us to live this life and we'll talk about that uh, some more in a moment now the problem is for us as human beings and as Christians is that we don't live it we think like the laborers in this parable in this story that if we are good we deserve more that if we've done better stuff than that guy over there that we should somehow receive more of God's grace we should get more we are better and that somehow we deserve more in our daily wage than that person over there we continue to live as if it is a merit-based system with God. And the Bible, and this parable in particular, show us in a powerful way that this is not God's way. This is our own sinful humanness view of what has value and what has worth. And this has serious consequences to our spiritual health, friends. Do not dismiss how easily we fall into this trap. And it's a spiritual trap, no question about it. So I have another quote for you, and this is also from Philip Yancey. He says, a counselor said, 
Many years ago, I was driven to the conclusion that the two major causes of most emotional problems among evangelical Christians are these. The failure to understand, receive, and live out God's unconditional grace and forgiveness, and the failure to give out that unconditional love, forgiveness, and grace to other people. We read, we hear, we believe a good theology of grace, but that's not the way we live. The good news of the gospel of grace has not penetrated the level of our emotions. So friends, we are called to live in grace. The joy, the peace, the excitement that we should feel from that, we, we shouldn't even be able to contain it. It should just be busting out and evident to all people. But unfortunately, friends, we don't live with a view of grace. We live with a view of merit. But this is not God's way. So I want to encourage you to remember that this message of grace is a good one. In another place, uh, it was said that um, we unfortunately do not live with the joy that we are headed to heaven. We live instead in judgmentalness and looking around to see who's maybe getting a better deal than us. I want to share a, a very personal story that I experienced. Uh, and it happened with a good friend of mine when I was ministering in Indiana. Uh, my friend's name was Mike. He was a mechanic. He owned his own shop. He was a good man. Uh, loved by his wife and his children, ran a good business, did good work on my cars, always gave me a great deal. I mean, he was a good guy, absolutely. But he was never really in a relationship with Christ. And it was something that bothered his wife, no doubt. And, and she would pray about it and put it up as a prayer request. He was a good man, but just not living in a relationship with Christ. But everybody knew him, everybody who interacted with him in the business, who spent time with him at his house or uh, just enjoying his presence, we all had a great time with him. He was a wonderful guy, but he wasn't a relationship. Well, my friend Mike got cancer. He battled bravely for a couple of years, but ultimately that, that cancer got the better of his physical body. And he went into the hospital and he was in there and it was uh, clear that this was, this was going to be the end of his time here on earth. And he had a couple days, as I remember it, where he was kind of in and out, uh, the medication, of course, trying to keep him out of pain. But he had this moment of clarity towards the end. Uh, I think like the day or so before he actually did pass. And he had this moment of clarity. And his loving wife, also a wonderful person, uh, went up to him and, and, and just started to talk to him again about giving himself to Christ in relationship, even at that late hour, even at that moment, to, to say... It is only through Christ that I will receive the joy and the blessing of being God's child and be made right with God. And, and his wife told us all uh, there, his, his tears were streaming down my friend Mike's eyes, that he nodded his head and began the greatest journey and exciting experience of his life by becoming a child of God. And I believe with all of my heart that today, Mike is in heaven worshiping our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I had the honor of preaching at his funeral, and I used this text because it's, his story was an incredible reminder that no, no point, no, it does not matter when we arrive at the party, we are still there. And it doesn't matter at what point we come to faith and, and relationship in Jesus. His grace is big enough and awesome enough and broad enough to accept us all into his kingdom. Just like these laborers at the very end of the day who received the same blessings and the same common reward that we all look forward to because it is God's grace. It is not our work or our merit that has earned it. And his grace is big enough and broad enough, deep enough, strong enough to accept us 
and to love us and bring us in to relationship with him at any point in our life. Also, while I was in Indiana ministering, I had the opportunity to uh, read a headstone. I was in a graveyard that day, and the headstone said something like this. It said, he was a great scientist who spent his life making discoveries. The last week of his life, he discovered God. And I have never forgotten that, because what an incredible picture right there in this beautiful cemetery the sun was shining that day, it was a beautiful temperature, it was gorgeous, the flowers were blooming, and there was this incredible message right there on that headstone that God's grace is always available to us whenever we come to Him. That whenever we desire relationship, God's faith, grace, His love for us is still there. And I know many would say, well, you know, that's probably just fire insurance. That, you know, that just at the end, you know, you hear these stories and these comments all the time. Uh, well, you know what, I'm going to live however I want, and then I'm going to, at the very end of it, I'm going to begin my relationship with God, and I'm going to get into heaven, and it's going to be okay. And, and I don't believe that that's the way it works, friends. And there's two reasons for that. First of all, because I've never actually heard of anyone doing that. I mean, in my experience as a pastor of the Word of God and of uh, a minister of His grace uh, to others, I've just never seen or heard of that happening. And I think that the reason for that is that for the hardened heart, the, the soul that has said for 60, 70, 80, 90 years to God, no, I don't want anything to do with you. You stay over there, I'll stay over here. That heart doesn't change at that moment, even when faced with death. That experience of decade upon decade of hardening of heart and rejecting God just becomes harder and more rejection there at the very end of life. Now other pastors may have seen other things and you may have heard of different stories, but I just don't believe that there are these many people who spend their whole life saying no to God and then all of a sudden say yes in a false or fake sort of way, as if they were somehow trying to buy insurance, fire insurance sometimes it's called in the pulpit. So I don't really think that happens, even though that's a critique that people try to throw out there. And secondly, the reason I don't think that this uh, fake sense of getting saved at the very end here of physical life, I don't think that really happens because, number one, uh, number two, God is not mocked. God knows who we are. God knows the state of our heart and soul. God knows the repentant heart when it comes to him in repentance and acceptance of God's offer of grace, just like my friend Mike. And I praise the Lord that his love and grace is so deep and so broad that it will love all who come to him. And friends, that should give us great joy. But unfortunately, so often, the church doesn't look joyful. The church doesn't look like we live in grace. It looks like we still live with merit. But our calling is to live out grace, even now, even in difficult times, even in uh, some isolation and our self-distancing and everything that's going on in our world. We are still called to live out grace. We're called in our own lives to live that out, to recognize that we can't earn God's salvation. In our own life, friends, that should give you a freedom to live, a joy to live. There was this uh, wonderful praise song that many of us sang uh, about 10 years ago that the song was, uh, we are free to dance. I said, we are free to live. We have been freed by God's grace to joyously live the life he has given us. And friends, this is good news. We don't have to look sour. We don't have to look grumpy. We don't have to be upset. We can live in joy, the grace, the peace. The excitement that God gives us because we're one of his children. So for you personally, stop trying to track your goods and your bads. You can't earn salvation. Yes, now friends, we're called to do works that are good because we live in relationship with God and his children should reflect his love and joy, of course. But when we start talking about trying to earn our salvation, 
when somehow we start to fall into the slippery slope or the trap that Satan sets for us that says you can earn, your merit can get you into heaven, then we've completely lost the joy that God's grace gives us. And we all need, regardless of whether you are a new Christian or you're an older Christian in terms of years and maturity, we all need to be reminded that it has been given to us for free. It's unmerited and it's given to all. It's great joy in that, friends. The other piece of this, of course, is that we need to live out that joy to others. We need to extend the grace that's been extended to us and extend it to others. And this is one of the mistakes, of course, that the earlier day laborers made when those were hired early on. They were aggrieved because they'd been out there longer. They had borne the harsh climate. They were upset about it. And they made the mistake of thinking that God's grace was based on merit. And uh, they, were, they were upset about it, obviously. So one thing to remember is that there are going to be rewards in heaven, as God tells us. We will be rewarded based on what we do. But the common reward of salvation is offered to all regardless of merit. And the common reward of being in heaven is going to be so great and so awesome that we have every reason to believe that the, uh, the individual rewards will actually pale in comparison to the incredibleness of the common reward of being with God Almighty and with Jesus Christ. So whatever individual rewards we receive, such as the parable of the talents and other parables in the Gospel of Matthew show us, the common reward is going to be so amazing. And often, friends, when we have this conversation, we too quickly think about our special rewards in heaven or uh, the fact that we get to have this eternal joy. And instead, what we probably need to be focusing more on is that the joy is based in that we get to be with God, that Jesus Christ himself is the reward. Not our individual mansions or our individual opportunities and rewards in heaven. No, the actual common reward of Jesus Christ, that is the point. We get everything else thrown in because of who Jesus Christ is. We've talked about this before in some other sermons when we were all together in the same building. Jesus Christ is the reward that we all receive because of our relationship. The other things are just really great extras tacked on because of his love for us, not because of what we earned. So friends, I want to read this last part to you when we talk about extending grace to others. This again is coming from Philip Yancey, but it's a Gordon MacDonald quote, and he's well known uh, in Christian circles and writings. He says, and think about this, the world can do anything as well as or better than the church. You need not be a Christian to build houses, feed the hungry, or heal the sick. There is only one thing the world cannot do. It cannot offer grace. So we come full circle. And that grace is the unique Christian teaching that comes to us through Jesus Christ, unmerited favor, where we have a message to tell, friends. We have a message to live within the grace within us that should give us joy. But we also have the grace to give out, to show the world what God has done for us. We can live that out and demonstrate that because we have been called We've been called by Jesus Christ to be his hands and feet in this world and to live in grace and demonstrate grace to others so that they see that what they really desire, the fulfillment they all long for deep in their hearts, is the relationship with God through grace. No longer do we have to worry about whether we're good enough. Because Jesus Christ has stretched out his arms and said, Through what I have done, you will be good enough. Because of what I have done, because of my love for you, the Father will say, It is good. 
He will look at your sins that are covered by blood and he will say, come into my kingdom. Experience relationship with me, which is the great reward your soul has been longing for. So friends, even in a difficult time, even as we live uh, in a very different way with a virus that's changed all of our daily routines, God's love and grace is still ever present. It is still there. It is still there for us to live within the grace given to us by Jesus Christ. And it is grace that we can give out to those who we love, those we come in contact with in other ways, and those that God has placed in our sphere of influence. So pray for others. Give a call out to others. Check on others. Send cards. Send letters. Do whatever God has uniquely gifted you and given you the opportunity to share His grace and love today, even in different circumstances. Because those circumstances may change. God's love and grace to us is unchanging. And it will be there today, tomorrow, until the very end of history when God brings about the ends He has planned. So friends, take heart, take courage. No virus is going to slow down God. And no virus is going to change His love for you. And no virus is going to lessen the grace He extends to all of us. So live with joy. Know that you are loved by God. Let us join together in prayer. To God our Father in Heaven, this parable just reminds us so deeply at how your love and grace is so deep. It is so broad that you would accept as your child all who come to you. That all who become your children, regardless of whether they do it as a child, whether they do it middle-aged, or whether they do it right at the end of life, that your grace is wide enough, deep enough, broad enough, strong enough, ever-present enough, to accept that child into your kingdom. And we praise your name. We praise your name for who you are. We praise your name for the gift of grace that you offer to all. And we thank you through the power of the Holy Spirit who leads us to you. Lord, may we absorb that lesson. May we absorb that teaching into our lives and live with the joy that it gives us, the freedom the excitement that is there. And may we turn that out into the world. And may we share that with others. Even in difficult days, may we show the joy and the excitement that comes from living under the beautiful umbrella of grace. The gift that you have given to us all. And we praise your name that you have accepted us even when we were unlovable even when we were unworthy. So friend, if you've never begun that relationship with Christ, if you've always felt like you were either good enough or maybe that you would never be good enough, the message from this scripture teaching today is that you don't have to worry about being good enough. You just have to be willing to love God and have a relationship with Him. And so my prayer for you this morning is that you would begin that right now that you would turn to this God of grace and love and you would begin today to begin your relationship, that you would begin today to live in love and within grace of this Jesus Christ who gave all that he had for you. Friends, he rose again so that we would know we could live forever with him. And if you've been a Christian for many years, I just pray that this passage and this teaching today will just give us all just a, a lighter step today. Some of the news is so confusing and frustrating, just downright difficult sometimes. But friends, we can have a lighter step today if we live with the knowledge that we are free in Christ because of his unmerited favor given to us called grace. And I pray that he will give you the wisdom and the ability to see how he is going to use that joy for others in your life. How he may turn that into building his kingdom. 
and sharing his grace and love with other people. So Lord, we praise your name. We thank you today for what you have given us, what you have done for us, and all that you are. We praise your name individually and collectively. May our lives give glory to you and may we live forever in your love and your presence. In our Savior's name we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. So friends, I pray that God will bless your week. I'm glad that we were able to be together. I'm glad that we are able to look at this passage together. I pray that God will open your eyes to the joy that he gives you and show you ways that you can be a blessing to others and live out this message of grace to those that he brings you into contact with in whatever fashion or form that may be. Have a wonderful week. God loves you. Be safe. And we will talk again soon. Praise the Lord.